peace and all good. Welcome to the Franciscan webinar series sponsored by the Justice, Peace and Integrity of Creation Office in Rome. Uh, these webinars are offered in English, Spanish, Italian. Earlier on this year, we had one on migration, today on climate change, and in the fall, um, one on Laudato Si and the other one on issue of mining. Um, let us take a moment to pray. O oh, loving God, we give you thanks for the beauty of your creation and for the spring season that reminds us that you are indeed the one who makes all things new. You speak to us through the book of nature and the book of Holy Scripture. Help us to tune our ears to the signs of the times, to the cries of the poor and the clamor of our mother sister earth, calling our humanity to a deeper ecological conversion. As we, your church, prepare to celebrate the Holy Week, we focus on the mystery of Christ's death and resurrection. May the Holy Spirit of wisdom open the eyes of all Christians to see how you continue to carry and be nailed to the cross in the poor, in the victims of systemic injustice, in the ecological destruction brought upon the earth. <coughs> Give us courage not to run away from that suffering. Help us to follow the example of Jesus who shows us the way in washing the feet of his disciples. May we too do likewise as we serve the poor who are already beginning to suffer the consequences of climate change and its devastating effects on their communities. Putting our trust in you, we believe that one day we will also share in the power of your resurrection through Christ our Lord. Amen. Um, my name is Jacek Orzechowski. I'm a Franciscan friar, Holy Name Province, and member of the animation team um, of Justice, Peace, and Integrity Creation uh, for the Order. Um, before I introduce you to two of our speakers, um, I would like to uh, go over the agenda. We'll begin with introductions, uh, the problems, look at the problems and impacts of climate change, solutions, then uh, continue on with, with the focus on Laudato Si, our Franciscan response, and then we will have um, time for, for Q&A. Uh, during the presentations, um, if you'd like to direct a question to one of the speakers, please use the chat function in this webinar. You can find it along the horizontal bar towards the bottom of the computer screen. Each of the presenter will have um, 20 minutes each. Next, we'll have 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, and once again, we'll, for that, we'll use um, the webinar chat box. Uh, we'll conclude it with a brief prayer. Um, now, with for, without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce you to our, uh, to our presenters. Um, uh, Dr. Daniel Richter is the Vice President of Governmental Affairs at Citizens Climate Lobby. Danny came to work on climate by way of medicine, realizing the potential for ecologically destabilized climate to make lots of people sick. He decided that the best thing he could do for the most people was to prevent the global warming in its, face, in its first place. This led him to pursue a PhD in oceanography thinking that an understanding of the past warming and cooling trends would help him counter the current human cause, global warming. Danny joined a Citizens Climate Lobby staff in 2013 after, after five years as a volunteer and getting paid to the scientific research on all seven continents. He established CCCL's DC office, where he has been responsible for developing the overall legislative strategy of that organization. In addition to that, Danny has been working on clarifying the details of the policy prescription of his organization and interacting with other groups in Washington, D.C. He also oversees Citizens Climate Lobby's research program. A brother Keith Douglas Warner is a Franciscan friar in the Santa Barbara province and a practical social ethicist in the Franciscan tradition. He has a master's degree in spirituality from FCT GTU, and PhD in environmental studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, 
He's a senior director of education and action research at Miller Center for Social Entrepreneurships, Santa Clara University, California. He has designed and implemented innovative interdisciplinary educational programs that advance social justice and Catholic identity in higher education since he came to Santa Clara in 2003. He works, he works extensively with social enterprises and Catholic religious orders in Africa to advance the UN sustainability development goals in the spirit of Laudato Si and has recently collaborated with the California bishops to prepare a pastoral statement on the fourth anniversary of Laudato Si. Um, so without further ado, um, I invite the, the Danny Richter to, to begin his presentation. All right. Thank you very much, Jacek, and thank you everybody for participating in this webinar. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, and uh, as ever, I hope that uh, you find something useful in what I say, and I look forward to uh, addressing your questions. So uh, on the first slide, I thought I would start with uh, the, the essence of the problem uh, as I see it. Uh, keep it very simple. Uh, talk about how this problem translates into some pretty serious impacts. Uh, I think it's, for me, the most compelling impacts are about water. And then we'll, we'll talk about a couple of case studies uh, before I move on to potential solutions. So for me, the essence of the problem is this, that carbon dioxide, CO2, traps heat, the fossil fuels emit CO2, and that ice melts at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's, that's it. Um, it's very easy to overcomplicate this issue. Uh, when I was doing my PhD and studying this, I saw some of the best scientists in the world uh, get tripped up on this because there's actually so much research on science uh, that no one person can know enough about all of it to answer every question. And so I gave a lot of, uh, it took me seven and a half years to get my PhD, uh, going to all those seven continents, uh, but I got it done. And I gave a lot of presentations as well during those seven years. And I found the best way to do this was to just keep it simple. Carbon dioxide traps heat, fossil fuels emit CO2, and ice melts at 32 degrees. There is 80 meters, that's 262 feet, of sea level rise stored up in the ice sheets. And so if they all melt, then you see sea level rise by 262 feet or 80 meters. Um, and that's, that's going to have a lot of, a lot of consequences. Uh, so this is the essence of the problem. And for me, I like to show this, this graph. All you're showing is uh, the most prominent greenhouse gases. CH4 is methane, N2O, nitrous oxide. Ozone is O3, CO2 is carbon dioxide. Water is an important greenhouse gas, but we can't control that except by controlling the others. And so I like to just highlight these uh, these peaks where you see there's absorbance uh, in the nanometer wavelength of CO2. That's it. We know it traps heat. So next. So why is this a problem? What, how does trapping heat translate into problems? Um, well, the essence of the problem, again, for why this impacts humans and, and human ecology is that it, it moves water to where it doesn't belong, where we don't want it. And so, like I said, the only way we can really control water water vapor uh, or frozen water or, or melted water is through controlling those other greenhouse gases. And so I'm going to tell you uh, two stories uh, about wa water where it doesn't belong. Uh, one about melting ice sheets and one about uh, an analogy for the atmosphere as a sponge. And so next. So the first one is, uh, I think, pretty straightforward. It's just melting ice sheets raise sea level. So as I said, there's about 80 meters of sea level rise stored up in all the ice sheets uh, in the world. And for most of Earth's history, there has not been ice sheets on continents. Uh, so the biggest ice sheets right now, there's East Antarctica, there's West Antarctica, and there's Greenland. Those are the biggest ice sheets um, right now. And for most of Earth's history, there has been no ice uh, permanently year round on the planet. So when you melt all this ice, uh, sea, sea level rises. And so you have intrusion of salt water into drinking water. Uh, sea, sea, you know, sea level goes up and houses get flooded. It, 
places get flooded. There's, it's, uh, to me, this is pretty, pretty direct. And this is also how I got into this partly at the, at the first place. I found this so compelling that this is, I had this insight before I, I, I started my PhD, just the, the capacity for, uh, to go back to an earth where there was no permanent ice on the planet and the damage that it would bring was so compelling to, uh, a younger me that I decided I would spend seven and a half years uh, working at a PhD to try and understand that more so I could communicate it more. Uh, next. Now the sponge analogy, uh, I, it actually works quite well to think of the atmosphere like a sponge. Uh, and when you make the atmosphere hotter, you're basically increasing the size of the sponge. Now if you think about a sponge, when you move a sponge over a wet place, it takes up some of the wet. And when you squeeze out a sponge, uh, you, you release the wet that it has soaked up. And so if you make a, have a larger sponge and you put it in a wet place, you're gonna be able to soak up more water. So that's like desertification. And if you squeeze it out, uh, a bigger sponge, you're gonna have more water coming out in one place. So that's what we've been seeing a lot of in terms of floods, uh, bomb cyclones and the like. Uh, so the, the, this goes back to water not going where it, where it belongs. And a warmer atmosphere basically is, is functioning as a bigger sponge. And so if we go to the next slide, um, I think that the best way to tell this is through, is through case studies. So I'm going to tell two stories, one story about Syria and one story about Bangladesh, about how these threads, these physical elements of what I've been talking about, how they weave into the fabric of our lives, how they weave into our, the fabric of our culture, uh, and how that can create real problems for people. So first of all, Syria. Uh, Syria has been experiencing droughts nearly every second year for the past half century. From 1961 through 2010, Syria was hit with almost a quarter century worth of drought. The typical picture of drought impact is that you see a reduction in agricultural yield, this damages food supply, livestock, and farmers directly. The Syrian crisis is a poignant case study of the severe macro impacts drought can have on society. <clears throat> the Syrian drought became increasingly severe, reaching its peak from 2007 to 2010, when the country experienced its worst drought on record, turning about 60% of the land into desert. These three years preceded the uprising in 2011 which began the civil war. The decrease in rainfall occurred in conjunction with a long-term drying trend, so this is that sponge analogy, and this is a large part of what made that drought so disastrous. So at first, the drought caused what we would typically expect, increasing insecurity in water and agriculture, as well as livestock mortality and agricultural, agricultural failure. This in and of itself was a humanitarian crisis leaving people without adequate food and water. From 2005 to 2010, the UN found that Syrian herders lost 80 to 85% of their livestock, 80 to 85%. And completing this picture for water, for farming in Syria, the Syrian government initiated policies in the early 2000s, which tried to expand agricultural production like land redistribution and fossil diesel fuel subsidies, this decreased the amount of groundwater available for the one third of farmers who rely on irrigation and groundwater. The other two thirds of farmers rely on rainwater alone. And as I mentioned, that decreased uh, from 2000 to 2010. Rural farming areas became increasingly desolate as food became scarcer and prices rose, initiating a mass migration of up to 1.5 million people in a country of only around 20 million from rural areas to urban cities. This mass migration and, uprise, and rising unemployment and poverty rates contributed to instability and social unrest in the Arab Spring, uh, eventually leading to the uprising against President Bashar al-Assad in March of 2011. And there's considerable consensus that climate change is a threat which can lead to greater instability in parts of the world. And Syria is a prime example of how interconnected the threads of climate and culture can be and the consequences when you start to unpick those threads. Currently, there are 5,300,000 registered, registered Syrian refugees, and those numbers have been steadily increasing. 
The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights has documented the death of 371,000 persons since the beginning of the revolution in March 2011, 112,000 of which were civilian. So Syria is an important example of that prioritizing our environment results in, uh, is important not just because we are called to be responsible stewards of the earth, but because we are also called to care for our brothers and sisters. If we want to truly live out this call and promote peace, we need to understand the role that climate can have in creating instability and in war. Now I'd like to talk about Bangladesh. So this is about the, the sea level rise part of this. So that was the sponge analogy. Here's the melting ice one. Uh, sea level is expected to rise more than three feet by 2100. It can be difficult to know when and where these impacts will fall, but it's certain that low-lying coastal communities will be heavily impacted. We know about island nations like Tuvalu and the Maldives, but one of the biggest risks is often overlooked, and that is Bangladesh. Bangladesh is the eighth most populous country in the world. It is home to 167 million people. This is equivalent to 2.18% of the world's population. It is also one of the poorest countries in the world and produces only 0.3% of the carbon emissions which are driving sea level rise. It is going to face among the direst consequences. Bangladesh is one of the most densely populated countries in the world, averaging 3,344 people per square mile. There are 160 million people living in the Ganges Delta which is about one fifth the size of France. Size of France is made up of 230 major rivers and streams. The rivers in Bangladesh are highly polluted, in part because of heavy drinking, uh, heavy metal contamination. So the country relies heavily on groundwater for drinking. This pumping, the pumping required to extract the groundwater, causes the land to settle, which further sinks the land and increases the risk of exposure to sea level rise. Studies have shown, agreed that by 2050, the country can expect 17% of the land to be underwater, displacing around 18 million people. Bangladesh's ambassador to India, Tariq Karim, puts the estimate at 50 million people leaving the country by 2050. We saw the devastation that climate can have in Syria, and now we're looking at another humanitarian crisis from rallies in sea levels in Bangladesh. Here again, we see how human culture and livelihoods, particularly of the poor, are entwined with the climate system. Understanding these threats helps us to have a chance at lessening their impact, but it does take action. So now let's talk about action. Let's talk about solutions. Uh, first of all, uh, let's just talk about what these solutions are. So next slide, please. There, there are a few levers which we can call, pull here. So mitigation is basically means that we're emitting less. Mitigation is to mitigate how much greenhouse gases, pollutants we're putting up into the air. That falls under mitigation. Adaptation is talking about reducing current and future impacts. It's not trying to reduce the, the cause of the problem. Uh, this is trying to heal the damage that's already been done. And it's best if this is, takes place on a local level. I'm not gonna talk about this in this presentation, but another lever we could pull is climate intervention. And there's two broad categories. Uh, you can reflect sunlight back to the back to the space, so you cool the planet that way. You can also take carbon dioxide, remove it directly from the atmosphere, and sequester it safely underground. Uh, both of those uh, can get a little bit scary. I think we do should be talking about them, uh, not yet necessarily implementing them, but again, I'm not gonna be talking about those in detail. And of course, because so much of this problem is human, how do we communicate this problem effectively? So let's talk about mitigation. If we're talking about emitting less, first we need to understand what we're emitting. And this is a graph from the latest uh, special report uh, on a 1.5 degree world. Uh, oh no, excuse me, on the, the fifth assessment report from the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. If you wanna understand the, the physical impacts, the science behind this, the IPCC is the place to go to. Uh, this is from the summary for policymakers for that fifth assessment report. And here you can see just the greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere. So the orange here is CO2 from fossil fuels and industrial processes. That's the bulk of the problem, is the, the orange. It's 65% of the contribution. The, the red there is CO2 from uh, land use, uh, forestry and other land use, FOLU. Uh, so that's 11%. The light blue is CH4, that's methane, that's from using natural gas, that's 16% of the warming today. 
Then you have N2O, nitrous oxide, uh, that's 6.2%. And then F gases, those are fluorinated gases, HFCs, CFCs, HCFCs. These are man-made gases uh, that do not occur in nature. And those account for 2% of the warming we've seen today. So if you want to look at mitigation, first, this is the problem. These are the things that we need to mitigate, net less of. And if we go to the next slide, uh, I've identified some quick policy and personal ways that we can start to do this. So the, the biggest thing uh, you can do, I believe, is to put a price on carbon. And this is what my organization, Citizens Climate Lobby, has been focusing on for nine years. There's a bill in front of the United States Congress that is the most aggressive bipartisan climate bill ever introduced in the United States. Uh, and it is uh, Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. It's HR 763, if you want to look at it. But uh, that is uh, one way of doing this. There are other ways. You can also subsidize alternatives. Subsidize means to make them uh, less expensive, uh, make them cheaper. You can also regulate emissions, the government putting out a mandate, um, saying you can only emit this much. You can also set targets. We will emit this much by this year. Uh, and you can incentivize um, ambition there. And on the personal level, uh, that's fine for the government and society level, but what can you do on a personal level? Well, first of all, you can vote, you can become involved in politics. That's a, a big way that you can help towards mitigation. Consuming less, um, I have been a vegetarian for 17 years. That's a surprisingly big way to reduce your emissions. Uh, also, I like to think about heating, heating water, heating things up in general. Uh, it's energy intensive to heat things up. Uh, and of course, engaging and educating in your community. Again, this is a human problem. It's more than it is a physical problem, I think. And so uh, what you're doing on this webinar is, is, is certainly a part of that. Uh, so the next thing, adaptation. Uh, some examples of adaptations you can have. Uh, again, this needs to be local. And this is not trying to fix the problem. It's trying to make human, the problem more livable. So for example, hospital generators. After Hurricane Harvey struck Houston, uh, hospitals started moving generators to higher floors because they found in there, their basements flooded and that short, they couldn't use the generators. It's really important to keep hospitals functioning in an emergency like that, so putting hospital generators on higher floors. Uh, hurricane proofing building codes. Hurricanes are getting stronger. There's some evidence of that. And so uh, updating building codes. Flood defenses, building dikes, uh, you know, making sure uh, levees are strong. Um, thinking about siting houses, maybe we need to move houses further up. Maybe we don't want to build new houses. Migration corridors for wildlife, making sure that as temperature zones, climate zones shift, that wildlife can still uh, move to where they need to go, where they can survive, and perhaps helping uh, organisms that are not as uh, mobile as some others move plants. Uh, for example, not as uh, mobile as animals. Forestry to mitigate fire, fire loss, uh, forest breaks, paying attention to planting, um, lots of techniques you can do there, and developing drought resistant, uh, drought tolerant crops. Uh, these are all things that we can do to adapt. And then finally, uh, communication. Uh, here, I just wanna highlight, uh, slide please. Here I just want to highlight uh, three sources that I find very useful in my work here in Washington, D.C. The Yale Program on Climate Change Communication is, is really excellent. Uh, they have a map in the United States for how climate uh, opinions are right now on a variety of topics, how they changed over time. They've created this concept of six Americans from alarmed to dismissive. And I find that frame very useful for approaching people. And the, the number one thing that I take away from that I think in the United States, there are 21 million people who are alarmed about climate change in the United States. There are not 21 million people who are engaged. And so there's a large pool of people in every community who we can engage. The Righteous Mind is a book by Jonathan Haidt. And what I find useful about that, he identifies liberals, conservatives, and libertarians, and he highlights the values that these groups have. They're not different, they're the same values, but we just emphasize them differently. So for example, conservatives, uh, he identifies six values. They place value uh, pretty evenly across those six. And whereas liberals in the United States at least tend to value uh, uh, justice uh, very highly and purity very highly, I think it's purity, uh, justice and fairness uh, very highly. And so we all have the same values, 
but just a different prioritization in, in a very legitimate way result in a totally different decision matrix. And I find that useful because number one, it makes uh, people I disagree with, their, their decisions make a lot more sense. And it tells me that I can connect with them. We all share the same values. We just prioritize them differently. Um, and I think in America today, that's really important. Uh, last one, uh, I know I'm at time. Uh, the, uh, what was that? Um, the uh, cultural cognition process project at Yale, always talk about a solution and then listening, super important. Uh, if you do happen to meet a climate denier, please do listen. Uh, sometimes they need to just say what they have to say and uh, it can be really hard, but if it's a half hour, an hour a day, uh, listen to them and you'll be amazed at where you can pop out on the other side. So, thank you. Thank you, Danny. Uh, Brother Keith. Hello everyone, it's morning here in California and good day to you wherever you are. Next slide, please. So what I would like to do is uh, um, build upon what Danny has uh, articulated as uh, the, the scientific um, dynamics of climate disruption that's unfolding, ways in which we can respond as a, as a human family and ways that we can respond in our local communities as individuals. And I wanna, I wanna describe um, the role that um, practical social ethics, and specifically in Laudato Si, can be a great aid for helping us to uh, search within ourselves our own motivation and share um, a vision of hopeful engagement despite the disruption that's going on, inspired by Laudato Si. So uh, Laudato Si is really a remarkable document by any standards. Um, and so one of the, the, the things that's remarkable is the way in which it's in dialogue with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and really efforts to foster a more equitable form of economic development at a global level that protects the earth. But unlike um, the United Nations Goals, Laudato Si presents this holistic framework which calls for a renewal of our, uh, of, of our humanity renewal of our more our vision for living together so it really is all encompassing and it really represents in in some ways that the 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 we can think of it as gathering all of the wisdom from catholic social teaching in its various forms over the past uh, couple of decades and focusing it on uh the what is the task that is at hand and the importance of an integrated approach to development which looks at um, uh, the, the needs of the poor, as described by Danny, exemplified in Syria and Bangladesh, but also the need to protect the planet at the same time, and how these are always, always integral, and how they fit together. So this is, this is more than a technical document, although it, it, it builds on, um, uh, on science and policy rather well. Um, but Laudato Si projects a vision for Catholic eco-spirituality for the 21st century. In many ways, it, it presents an agenda, a social agenda for uh, Catholics and people of faith over the next, uh, for, the, for the immediate future. So I think it's, it's important that, to recognize that it, it, it pulls all those things together and then points us forward. The first couple of chapters uh, of Laudato Si are really good and they present the most significant um, science uh, uh, scientific uh, engagement by the Vatican that I know of, at least in chapter one, but it's the last two chapters, uh, chapter five and chapter six, which are really in my mind the best. I would encourage if you, if you haven't read all the way through to be sure you get to those two, because they present a vision for engaging the institutions in society in chapter five and chapter six, which is titled uh, an Ecolo ecological education and spirituality which really is, I think, the, the framework that it presents for guiding us forward. Next slide, please. Now, for us as Franciscans, I think it, this is a really a key moment because this is the most holistic, I'm sorry, the most Franciscan papal encyclical ever. Jacek, next slide. Okay. So the most, the most significant papal encyclical, uh, most Franciscan papal encyclical ever. Um, St. Francis is held up as a model for uh, 21st, uh, Catholic spirituality, 21st century Catholic spirituality. He, he is cited a dozen times in the document. 
Uh, and Francis and Fran a Franciscan approach, a Franciscan way of seeing care for the earth and care for the poor is always necessarily going together, which is, I think, a key Franciscan insight, is really underscored and presented to the church in a very fresh and uh, contemporary way. So um, this, this, this notion of, of this being rooted in Francis's devotion to the incarnation and being rooted in our beliefs as Catholics uh, and that our actions should be emerged from those beliefs, this is a really great opportunity for us as Franciscans. Are we able to recognize it? Are we able to take it up? In many ways, this is a, the most Franciscan moment in the church in my lifetime, maybe in a long time. And uh, uh, this, this papal encyclical is, it should find particular resonance, I believe, in the hearts and lives of Franciscans because it speaks to something that is not just the, the, an external agenda, but also connects with this, the example of our Father Francis and uh, core components of our Franciscan spirituality. So, so I, I say this in part because what Danny has explained in, in very good detail, uh, using science and talking about policy and talking about um, what we need to do it together as a society, We've known the outlines of these things. The, the, early, the early inklings we got a couple of decades ago. The Catholic Church has been talking about this in various authorities for more than 20 years. And yet, and yet, in America as particularly, there's a resounding silence in terms of response. Very little, very little on the margins. So for me, as a Franciscan representing this, being being one of one of you know the, one of the lar one of the largest movements within Catholicism, uh, the, the Franciscan family, I just feel like this is our moment to shine, and it's our obligation to step forward and to to draw on our spiritual spiritual traditions and focus it on the kinds of things that Danny spoke about, but to do so in a specific way that's faithful to our tradition. Next slide. So. The, 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 so the question that, that, can, that, that I continue to reflect on is how can we motivate ourselves? How can we motivate people in our local communities? How can we motivate our Catholic institutions to fulfill the vision of Laudato Si? Laudato Si presents this new word as a, a it's, it's an innovative term uh, called integral ecology, which in some ways is like, it's inconvenient because it's not defined by the document, but I would say it's defined in, in how it's described how we should live together, how we should live out our faith and spirituality. I think in, this is a term that was written in another language, Italian. Um, I think for us, I think the best way to, 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 to translate it or a, a more helpful synonym is ecological spirituality. That is a spirituality that takes in to account the sum total of our dependent, interdependent relationships with other people and with the earth and with the material world and calls forth a response inspired by God to love, service, and to correct the broken relationships and to heal those broken relationships and to live in humility with the rest of creation. So that would be my understanding of, loud, of uh, integral ecology presented by uh, chapter four here and referred to uh, throughout the document. And it's interesting that Pope Francis calls St. Francis of Assisi the, um, the example par excellence of integral ecology to which we are all called to live to get today. And Laudato Si speaks of this as being called to respond as a vocation, as, as a part of our vocation of responding to God. So to me, the, there's there, the, 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 the theological, religious, and spirituality framework for responding to the crises that Danny has talked about is embedded, it's woven into a Laudato Si. If you haven't read it, I urge you to read it. If you need, I, I urge you to engage other like-minded and maybe not like-minded people in reading it together and discussing it together. I'll share in the chat box in just a moment what I think is the best uh, discussion guide, which was created by a group called Romans 6. Um, about a group of Franciscans that I think is quite helpful. Okay, next slide, Yatze, please. So, um, as I mentioned, the Franciscan family is quite large and diverse, and the OFM Franciscans are just one 
of multiple groups uh, within the Franciscan family. I want to speak about them because they're the ones that I know the most about. Uh, and I think that there's a, a really good, um, um, uh, there's, there's some, some interesting things that are beginning to appear. It's a, it's, it's a little, it's a little slow for my taste, but I think it's, uh, it's, uh, helpful. Okay. So I just dropped a piece in the, in the chat box about, uh, Laudato Si is the most Franciscan encyclical ever. And I'm also going to drop in there the Romans six study guide to Laudato Si, which I also think is quite helpful. And you can find the links there and download them yourself. Um, so uh, I was recently at the plenary council of the order in Nairobi last year, which was the, uh, which is like every few years we have a big global strategy conference. And, and so um, while I was at that conference, uh, Laudato Si came up prominently and, and some, as something that the Franciscans from around the world are engaged in and are trying to determine a way that this can be applied in a way that's appropriate to their local communities, which I think is really the challenge for all of us and a challenge I want to share with you webinar participants to find out what's the best way for you to um, respond to Laudato Si in your local communities. Here are some examples. The Franciscans throughout Spanish-speaking Latin America, in other words, from the Mexican border with the U.S. to Tierra del Fuego at the southern tip, organized a simultaneous uh, pilgrimage where groups from both ends of this kind of these two continents would um, would pilgrimage from their respective through their respective countries, holding events with the Franciscan family, talking about the Franciscan themes of Laudato Si and and animating local action and engagement until they met in the area of Northern South America. Uh, and I see Iggy Harding's on the call. He might be able to say more about this. He probably was there. Um, and, and they had a grand celebration to both point to the, you know, the, the wonderfulness of the Franciscan theme, but also to call us all to action, ecological conversion, and local responses. In France, the Franciscans organized uh, another pilgrimage. Uh, this one involved one that was uh, both as a group and as individuals, where there would be a very conscious journey to in, into the spirituality of Laudato Si, that people would, it was sort of like a combination of a pilgrimage and a retreat, and people did it in silence and also in group together. In uh, Southern Asia um, and Southeast Asia, um, the Franciscans have rural development centers, and they've been fostering sustainable agriculture as a service to the local farmers to help them develop new techniques that are more uh, able to respond, to, to, to able to feed their families more effectively, but also to respond to the changing climate. Because uh, one of the things about going to, um, uh, to an international gathering is you discover very quickly that everyone in the world knows that global climate change is happening, and there's only really one country where there's broad denial that it's happening. Uh, so next point is in Eastern Europe, uh, many of the, the fr friars minor have been working extensively with youth and they organize what have been youth camps. These are classic activities, but what they're doing is they're folding in the spirituality of Laudato Si and uh, ecological spirituality into those existing programs that they have in the summers and advancing um, their engagement with youth that way. And uh, Franciscan Action Network, uh, uh, of which uh, Jacek is quite active in, uh, is, has, has done a number of activities related to raising people's awareness about climate uh, disruption, um, giving uh, public witness to the need to uh, amend our ways and to undergo conversion. Um, so I would just in, in, uh, encourage everyone, in, if you're in the U.S., to check out the examples of their work, um, in, and, and I'm sure some of that's in collaboration and coordination with Danny's organization. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so um, these are really the what I think of as the the, the spiritual responses that are, are about that are about engaging the practical, concrete actions that Danny spoke about, but then finding a way to tap into something deeper within us because we have not responded sufficiently, and religious Catholics, uh, I think, have a particular obligation to respond with great passion and energy to the call of Laudato Si, to engage in the kinds of public actions that Danny described. And so the question is, how do we tap into something that's deep in, in us to keep us engaged in a long-term 
struggle because you know, climate change is going to be with us no matter what happens in the in our lifetimes. The question is, can we keep it manageable? Can we can we live within a climate disruption disruptive world without massive calamity? And that that really is the the sobering uh, reality that we face. So this is going to require widespread ecological conversion. And the path forward, Lao Dr. C proposes, is ecological education and an active ecological spirituality. And I think that for those of us that are engaged uh, in any kind of religious ministry, this is an especially good conversation to have with youth. I just think it's a really good way to engage youth. Uh, and it, the youth have an idealism. They also need some measure of hope and faith. And despite this difficulty, they are the ones that will live with the, the world that we, our generation, well, my generation, and those older than me are bequeathing them. I think this is a, this is a, a call um, for us to engage with them and engage their enthusiasm and, and th their, of those different personas that Danny talked about. Those in a younger generation, under 35, they're, with a very few exceptions, they're pretty clear on what's happening and they want action. And I think that's our obligation uh, to, to help structure and guide that. Now, last slide, Yatsik. I apologize to everyone for the number of words on this, on this slide. Um, this is, but let me explain, and, and I'll let you uh, kind of read these on your own um, at, a, at a later date. Here's this plenary council document that, um, that I ref referred to earlier. This plenary council process produced a document, and the document um, that came out a few, uh, a few months ago is quite good for calling for us as OFM Franciscans to engage in uh, actions uh, responding to Laudato Si. And so <clears throat> these are the, the kind of the take home messages that, that came from our Minister General. And I, I know most of the people on the call are not members of the OFM, so my point is not so much for you to recognize this in your, in our, our, my group being exactly what your group should do, your branch of the Franciscan family, but for Franciscan hearted people, I think this is a good example of at least how one entity within the family is responding. And I invite you to work actively in your local fraternity of seculars or with a local group of minded Franciscan hearted people or within whatever religious organization you're a part of to drive home these kinds of concrete re responses to Laudato Si. So <clears throat> in paragraph 189, it's looking at the question of lifestyle indicated by Laudato Si. Danny referred to his, his vegetarianism as a good example. Uh, in 190, every entity of the order, every province, every uh, vice province, every group should address the theme of evangelization in the spirit of Laudato Si. So that means articulating Laudato Si and the call to conversion, ecological conversion with our existing religious ministries. And finally, in paragraph 191, to engage in collaboration with, all, with other groups, because this is climate crisis challenge is not something that's going to be responded in isolation within churches. It's gonna take a whole range of every kind of sector of society working together in solidarity. Religious orders in particular, I think, have a, and religious communities, congregations, fraternities, have an opportunity and obligation to engage many other kinds of people with other kinds of expertise and to work together. Um, and then for, for all those of us in religious communities to come up with definitive guidelines for our pastoral activity guided by Laudato Si so that it moves from text into life. And so with that, I will conclude my presentation and encourage all of you, wherever you are in whatever, whatever branch or twig or leaf or root of the Franciscan family to respond uh, passionately and, and with great um, enthusiasm and faith to the challenge before us, addressing the kinds of, uh, 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 advancing the kinds of solution described by Danny and inspired by uh, the, uh, the uh, teaching of Laudato Si. May the Lord give you peace. Um, thank you, Keith, and thank you, Danny. Um, I encourage those of you who are on this webinar to use a um, chat, uh, chat box um, to post any questions that you may have for Brother Keith or, or Danny. Um, in the meantime, um, 
I'd like to direct one question to, to Danny um, about, uh, there are about half a million Franciscans in the world. Um, um, what collectively, if you can help to kind of stretch our imagination, what type of collection action, collective action could Franciscan take? Uh, and either at the global level or in the United States, you have worked a lot extensively with um, with uh, secular groups uh, to create a movement, a citizens' climate lobby. So what kind of insights can you glean from uh, what are some of the elements of effective engagement? Yeah, uh, so I, I think that uh, so much of this is a human problem and not a, a technological problem. And I, I think that uh, Franciscans as people of faith have a, an ability to connect with humans uh, in a way that... Um, that I, I think a lot of people lack. And so for, for, I would suggest, I won't suggest a specific action, but I think the theme that I would suggest for uh, Franciscans who have, I think, a, a special ability to connect on this human problem and, and chip away at the, the human resistance, uh, I would actually refer to that communication slide uh, that was at the very end of my presentation. Um, number one, there are more people who are alarmed uh, than than we than we expect they just don't know what to do and so i think finding those people looking for them engaging them providing ways for them to plug in and feel hope uh you know the, the people who are alarmed uh they, they lack a lot of hope they, they're looking for things to do they don't know how to do it and so uh engaging with them um and and helping them fill that need giving them hope uh through action i think would be really important and the other thing that I think uh, Franciscans uh, would be particularly good at is, is listening also on that, on that slide. I think it's not just about uh, deniers. I presented that as, you know, this is something for, for climate deniers, you know, listening to them. I've had many, many instances, both uh, in public and on Capitol Hill, where after listening to them, then they're open to hearing solutions. And that's been really, really powerful, but also to the growing number of people who are traumatized by, by this problem. Um, and I think that there's, uh, th there's so much, there's so much uh, anxiety and, and real trauma, uh, I think for people, again, in the alarmed who, who have been listening to this and seeing not just how the reports in the news, but how it affects their everyday life, that I think that there's a healing that again, uh, I think that uh, people of faith Franciscans would be particularly adept at providing by listening to that trauma um, and uh, potentially uh, sharing that trauma with others, sharing the healing uh, and sharing the trauma so that we can all realize just, just all the threads that interweave in this, in this physical problem, this human problem, how they're all connected. I, I think that um, using that experience of listening and finding out those who are ready to do something, who need that hope, how they how they connect. Um, I think that, that that's that's the general area where I would suggest um, those uh, five hundred uh, thousand uh, Franciscans focus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um. So I would respond in a similar way, but I would just point out that Chapter Five of Laudato Si lays out a whole series of actions that can be taken at the institutional and community level um, that, are, that are very much consistent with what uh, Danny had just described. And then chapter six talks about what can be done at the personal and household level, at the level of family. Um, uh, so I think that um, the question of, of, of addressing the motivation and then finding a way to move from, kind of from the paralysis that a lot of us feel to action, recognizing in kind of good Catholic moral theology tradition is like taking action is an important piece of moving beyond the paralysis and then beginning to practice the virtue, especially in community. And that the, the kind of um, uh, formation process, and I mean kind of this an adult faith formation together in community that's envisioned by Laudato Si, is I think the kind of balm that's needed to address the, the, the sense of anxiety, which, we, which is you know, understandable, fear, uh, uh, injury. Um, we, all, we all know those feelings, but there's, I think we're called to overcome those with, by being open to God's grace, responding with love, but then also being uh, committed 
to addressing the situation through what we can do individually, wherever we are, whatever organization we're a part of, talking about it, listening about it, taking action where it's possible. And uh, uh, Laudato Si, uh, in Laudato Si, Pope Francis says, we cannot believe that what, that we cannot, we, we, it, we are not allowed to believe that our actions make no difference. They do. And that I think is Part right. of what uh, that requires a degree of engagement and, and faith for us to move there. So, um, uh, Maria uh, Garling has a question for, for Danny about uh, why Dr. Richter did not mention, didn't mention that in Syria the CO2 came primarily from, uh, from the war. So, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, so, if you look at uh, CO2 stays in the atmosphere for, for a very, very long time. And so if you look at the biggest contributors to CO2 uh, since the start of the Industrial Revolution, uh, you have to look at the United States. You also have to look at Great Britain uh, and Europe. And while there have been terrible wars uh, in, in both countries and they participated in wars, uh, blessedly there have been more years of peace than there have been uh, of war. And when you add it all up, more of the emissions have come from uh, peacetime than from war. There, there may be an uptick for an individual country when they are in a time of war. Certainly it ravages the land so that uh, forestry and land use, uh, you might see that uh, go up. But I don't think it would be accurate to say that most of the CO2 has come from countries when they are at war. Yeah, and uh, this is something that perhaps we can, uh, we can direct people to, uh, to further uh, resources. Uh, to read up on it, uh, but thank you. Um, uh, Brother Iggy Harding, um, should we not have Franciscans delegates to Catholic uh, Global uh, Climate Network from each fraternity, province, congregation, order, and institute? A significant Franciscan contribution to the church and the world by networking. Um, uh, Brother Keith? Yeah, I think that that's a, a very good uh, question. Um, so the Catholic Global Climate Network is something that's around the world, and it's international, um, and it's trying to uh, help people feel like that they're part of something bigger, right? Because this can be very discouraging, especially in the United States, where we've got such broken, toxic, um, dishonest politics, uh, where we can't even talk about what, what what is really happening in the world. So to be a part of a global movement is I think a really helpful thing. And this is a resource that we have as Franciscans. And I think we should take a good, good opportunity to participate because it helps us feel like we're not crazy by saying like, these are really prob serious problems. And so much of our media today is like, uh, nah. So by participating in other communities of goodwill and of, of engaged uh, ethical action, that can give us the courage and the, the, the strength to carry on through these things. So, yeah, I think, the, I think what Iggy has pointed out here is the very process of, of identifying, oh, we, are a, we Franciscans are a part of a much bigger international movement, and we as Franciscans are called to be and can effectively be a part of this bigger Catholic global climate network. I think that would be great. I think that would be great. Uh, because I, I think that that's what, just the process of becoming aware that it exists and that, that faith calls us to take action uh, and to engage at the local and global level, I think that's a, that's a wonderful strategy. If I may, I'll just chime in uh, and follow up on the question from Judd, uh, another, uh, another wonderful Franciscan, uh, this one in upstate New York. Um, uh, he's talked about bringing JPIC themes and uh, Laudato Si themes into their uh, RCIA or uh, adult uh, religious education program for prospective Catholics, um, and not just having it as an afterthought, but weaving it through entirely. So let me say a couple of things about that. First, I think it's really great that um, we, we see Laudato Si as a resource for faith formation and for setting an agenda for Catholic spirituality today. Certainly, I'm not proposing that we get rid of things, uh, you know, what we have been and what we bring from our tradition. But there's a way in which Laudato Si, like a prism, gathers light together and focuses it, to, focus it in, in one direction towards this big, compelling moral need to address 
uh, the integrated challenges of poverty and climate. They're not multiple, they're not different problems. They're the same problem with multifaceted uh, uh, and drivers that are bringing it along. So helping to, to identify that care for the earth and care for the poor are fundamental and, to, and necessarily woven into what it means to be an adult Catholic today, absolutely. And um, I haven't heard of it being done in RCIA. I like the idea. But I, it is something that is much more, uh, that, that seems to be taking, getting more traction in other places. I'm pointing specifically to an article that I linked in the chat box um, in the Philippines. Uh, the Laudato Si is very, very, uh, it's, it's, it is a big part of the agenda of the Philippine church. And so if adult faith formation is going on there, guided by this. And I would encourage you to do uh, this, to do the same, to find ways in which you can connect Laudato to see with faith formation in, in multiple different expressions in your local communities, and then use that to guide the formation process, and then also go on to, uh, to focus the, act the actions outward. Right. Um... Uh, Kelly Moulton um, from New York uh, sends a, a link to on a chat to, through a chat book to a, a material. Okay, a Catholic University of Antigua, Panama created a comic book on Laudato Si, available for purchase. Yet another opportunity to to engage the young people. Um, but uh, just to connect to uh, the comment uh, made by uh, Brother Judd about the power that we have collectively and institutionally to engage, be it through RCIA or creative ways, comic books, uh, videos, um, and to share those resources to provide faith formation material that is, uh, that is relevant that makes a difference in the world. Um, okay, can we, okay, and this is the last question. We have just one minute, two minutes left. Can we integrate care for creation with pro-life action? Um, anyone? <laughs> I feel like you could answer that, Yasek. Well, yes, yes, uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, definitely, I mean, um, I'm uh, here in Washington, Washington, D.C. every time um, every year we participate in the uh, Life to uh, <clears throat> March, uh, March for Life with our um, uh, consistent ethic of life. Um, there are some other communities uh, from Buffalo and from, from, other, from other areas lifting, uh, lifting that message up. But certainly we can, sh uh, we can share resources um, with, uh, with each other. So... Um, 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 we have the contact information of all those participating in this webinar, and um, we will all, we'll be providing um, some additional resources. Um, uh, I think it would be great if, uh, if Brother Jad could send maybe some materials for those who would like to... Um, do this uh, Laudato Si um, integrated approach to RCIA in their parishes. Um, and if you, there's some, uh, something else that you would like to share or have a particular interest in learning more about it, please contact us and we'll be, we'll be happy to, to share it with you. And uh, also please um, um, take advantage of the resources that are available through uh, the website of um, Justice, Peace, and Integrity of Creation Office in Rome. Um, there are a wealth of material there that you could use as well. So um, um, with that, I would like to once again thank uh, Danny and, and Keith uh, for, for their presentation and uh, wish um, all of you um, a blessed um, Holy Week and um, may you as individual and collective, uh, collectively experience uh, the power of Christ's resurrection. Peace and all good. Thank you.